This episode of The Dog Show features Emma Malik. Emma is the world's first and probably only animal training stand-up comedian. Making appearances as an animal trainer and comedian on shows such as The Jim Jeffries Show, Studio 10 and Better Homes and Gardens. Emma is the go-to trainer behind some of the world's rarest, weirdest and oftentimes deadliest animals. Training seemingly untrainable animals such as sharks and 400 kilo crocodiles to baby penguins and cuddly koalas. In the interview, we discuss how to train the untrainable dog. Hello, Emma. Welcome to The Dog Show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Will. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, I thought I was going to be speaking to an Australian because I know you're based in Australia, but you've got a bit of an accent, I hear. Thank you so much for recognizing that because <laughs> my British friends and family tell me that I've lost my accent and that I sound Australian. So uh, I really appreciate you recognizing that. But yes, I am originally uh, from the UK, but I, I live in Sydney, Australia now. I can resonate with that. My wife's uh, Canadian and she always gets um, you know a lot of hassling when she goes home about how she's got a hybrid Australian slash Canadian accent now. So... <laughs> And does it, does it, can you recognize that? Because my Aussie friends can't. No, not really. I think she still sounds Canadian to me. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so you've got a super interesting background in, I guess, working with animals and you're also a stand up comedian, all this really fun stuff. So I'm super excited to have a chat to you on the show today. But um, before we get into that, do you have a dog of your own? I have two. Don't want to show off. Uh, I have two. <laughs> well, I suppose one and a half. One of them's a chihuahua. I mean, do we count that as a full dog? I'm not too sure. He's he's 2.8 kilos and he's fully grown. But yeah, I have a, a Labrador German Shepherd mix that I rescued from Thailand when I lived there. His name is Duktik. Uh, he came the name. It translates as fidget into Thai. And I also have uh, a little uh, chihuahua who I rescued last year. And his name is Gecko Esteban Malik Fiesta. That's that's a mouthful. <laughs> it is, yes, yes. He goes by the name Oi when we're out. Um, so how? I, I guess that was going to be my next question: whether they were rescued or not. But um, what age were both the dogs when you when you rescued them? Uh, so Dug Dig was around one, and Gecko was around one. Dug Dig's now eleven, and uh, yeah, Gecko's just turned two. So they were fairly young when I got them. Okay, okay. And was it challenging bringing? I can't even pronounce the name, but I'm going to try. Go on, give it, give it a crack, Will. Let's do it. It's Duck Dick? Duck Dick? Yeah, Duck Dick. Yeah, I know it's a bit weird because there's a weird sounding part of that name. But yes, it's Duck Dick. Um, it was a challenge. Um, it took seven months quarantine. Mm. And the thing was, Duck Dick um, wasn't even allowed straight into Australian quarantine. He had to spend six months in a rabies-free country before being allowed Um to enter Australia. So uh, he went on a six month all expenses paid by yours truly uh, vacation to Singapore. Wow. And then I uh, came over to Australia, spent one month in quarantine. And uh, yeah, he's here now. So I never planned on getting a dog when I was in Thailand. Mm. Uh, it just was an accident. It happened. And originally, I was meant to be moving back to the UK, where I could just flown him in, providing he had all his vaccines. Uh, but then I got uh, sponsored to come to Australia as a dog trainer. Mm. So um, came on over and then realized uh, what it was going to take to bring him over. So it was seven months quarantine and $10,000. Wow. Yeah. I, I hear the Australian quarantine animals is, is one of the strictest in the world. Is that right? Uh, unless you're a racehorse, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are they don't have the same quarantine rules, or no, they can come on in. They're oh, fine. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Some rules for some, and some rules for others, mm. right? <laughs> it's when it's your pet, you can't say no. Mm. That's the that's the issue. So, but he was he was young, he was healthy. If I had left him in Thailand, it wouldn't have been a good fate. And I made a I made a deal with Doug Dick. I was like, if you just don't cost me any vet fees for the next ten years them was sweet and he was he was true to his word he has been a very touch wood yeah. healthy dog he's 11 now so uh yeah he's he's been a good boy yeah it's something you definitely need to consider i know that when we got out we have a french bulldog um but we had to take into consideration you know we, do we want to travel or live somewhere else in the world within the next 15 years um because 
the certain breeds, French Bulldogs, one of them, they really shouldn't be, shouldn't be flying on planes. Um, yeah. So you really need to take that into consideration when you're getting in, when you're getting a dog. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of those breeds, uh, airlines won't even allow them mm. to fly. And I had that same consideration uh, when I was choosing my next dog. So I got a, I wanted a little dog because I want to be able to travel um, just more freely and easier. And I, I love kind of staffies and those type of mixes, but so many airlines won't allow them. And so, yeah, I took that into consideration as well that, you know, what's a dog that I can easily travel with? And uh, Chihuahua seems the most um, the most easiest one because they're just so tiny. So, so you think you'll jet set away from Australia and see the world again when we're allowed to? <laughs> oh, gosh, if and when will, I don't know. Um, what I, with my job with comedy, there's always opportunities to travel. Hmm. Um, and I would prefer to have my pets with me. So hopefully I'll be traveling for work. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to fly him on vacation with me or anything like that. But um, if I have to go and work somewhere else overseas for a bit, I'm hoping, you know, I'll be able to bring my dogs with me. Yeah, I actually did an interview um, in an earlier show like quite a while ago with um, a girl who runs like an Instagram page for traveling with your dog. And wow. we, we focused mainly on domestic travel, but we spoke a lot about the um, the benefits of traveling with your dog and like how it can add a lot to the trip and you can go into all these remote areas and it's great for the dog, great for you as well. Was that in Australia? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That's yeah. awesome. Like, I have to look that up. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's probably distracting. But talk to me. How did you become the world's first ever animal training stand-up comedian? <laughs> and I think the only still at the moment. <laughs> um, so the animal training came first. Okay. So that I started that when I was uh, 17 back in the UK. I was training animals for the film and TV industry. Um, fast forward... Uh, gosh, seven years ago when I was um, making a bunch of strangers laugh at Sydney Mardi Gras and they asked me if I was a comedian. And I said, no, 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 I'm an animal trainer. And my friend just said, I dare you to try an open mic night. And so they signed me up, I think like a month later and I did it. And it was meant to be just a one-off dare. But I, um, yeah, I got noticed by some people there, some of the comedians. And then that... Um, yeah, that one-off dare has turned into a, a seven-year career and it's it's led to a lot of different paths. So um, I didn't have animals at first with me on stage. I um, I didn't bring that part of my life into it. And a few years in, I had comics telling me that I should, you know, bring my dog on and do things. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to be a serious comedian. And they're like, no one's going to take you seriously regardless, so just go for it. <laughs> um, so I, I did. I brought Dug Dig on stage and it was great. And then um, I started to incorporate um, a stick insect in my act and then a goldfish. And then this last show, we had a miniature pony as well. So it's, um, yeah, the animals don't do tricks. It's not, it's not like a circus show or anything like that. The whole idea of it is to, I interact with the animals um, and they're all part of a story and they just kind of hang out. So it's, um, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of fun. It's mm. definitely um, something different and I'm still getting my head wrapped around it. I'm just visualizing that first night that you got kind of bullied into going and doing the open mic and... I mean, that takes a lot of guts to do to get up and do that that first time. Yeah, and I was excited, though, as well, because it was just something completely out of my comfort zone. Mm. So it was really exciting. Um, and just that adrenaline rush, I hadn't had that adrenaline rush for so long. I used to, um, prior coming to Australia, when I worked in Thailand where I met Dug Dig, I worked at the world's largest crocodile farm and zoo. So I, I was working with dangerous animals all the time, so I had quite a, a really nice adrenaline buzz uh, most days. And I kind of didn't get that working with uh, dogs. Um so it was quite nice to have that nerves and that adrenaline again. Yeah, I think, most, well, there may be some dogs that might get close to the same um, adrenaline rush, but probably not. Yes, I did meet a couple. Of, <laughs> yeah, no, I have I have definitely had two uh, since being in Australia where I was just like, oh, my gosh, here we go again. <laughs> but so, yeah, probably not, probably not quite a crocodile or I know you've done uh, other things with, I'm just reading it now, sh uh, sharks and crocodiles. Penguins, mm. penguins and koalas sound pretty pretty nice and chilled but <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely Well, penguins have got quite the bite though if they want to all right okay 
Um, well, I guess that leads me to the next question because today's topic's all about the untrainable animal, the untrainable dog and how you can work with untrainable dogs or what people may characterize as untrainable dogs. Um, from your experience of working with all these exotic animals and working with dogs as well, what, what's, what are the typical characteristics of, of a dog that might be considered un, untrainable? Well, see, it's different to a wild animal. So people, when they think of untrainable animals, they think of animals which just no one's really seen being trained. So like a goldfish or, or a shark um, or, I don't know, like a, a rabbit or something like that. They think of dogs, pigs, horses. Um, with untrainable dogs, it's the excuse I hear often is, oh, uh, it doesn't listen to me. You can't train it. It, it doesn't listen. Mm. Um, I think so, yeah, that's where the two slightly differ. Okay. Okay. So I guess from a, a dog owner's perspective, I'm just thinking, I, mean, I guess there's probably small things that you might consider untrainable, like they don't listen, so they won't, you know, come when called or, or whatever it is, but there's, mm. there might be more extreme things like we're to behavioral issues, like aggression and things like that as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, off, uh, so the common ones I would hear is uh, they don't listen or uh, they're crazy. Hmm. And that's just like, you can't do it. They're just crazy. There's something not right, you know. Um, so, yeah, they're the two, two excuses that I hear. And probably the owner's crazy if that's the case as well. Like, oh, I have said that. I, <laughs> I'm not judging crazy pet owners or dog owners here, by the way, because I'm pretty sure I'm slowly turning yeah. into one as well. I mean, when I looked to myself at my stand-up show, I had a glass of wine in one hand and a miniature horse dressed as a unicorn in the other. And I was thinking, <laughs> this is why I'm single. Uh, this is like a weird... So I'm not, I'm not judging the crazy dog owners here. But definitely the first dog that I worked with here in Australia was on Prozac twice a day. Yeah. Um, and so was the owner. Well, I mean, I know I'm a crazy dog owner, so I'm not. I'm not going to judge anyone else. <laughs> yeah. this is so... I think you've got to admit it. I think if yeah. you admit it, you're you're not as crazy as, as some. But um, you accept it, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, you just accept it. It's part of the process. Um, okay, so how do you approach, um, you know, a dog or any animal that you've worked with that may be considered untrainable or has got these embedded issues they may have grown up with and and you're looking to break into? Yeah, well, I mean, and this is the thing, like dogs are some of the easiest but animals that I've worked with and trained, but also some of the hardest mm. as well. So the beautiful thing about working with exotic animals or native Australian animals is um, no one's really tampered with them, even in the zoo or aquarium settings that I work with. Yes, you might have had a few trainers in the past that have made mistakes and the animal's got bad habits, but no one's done anything really bad, like, re like years and years of bad breeding or... Um, just you know raising bad dogs um so dogs can definitely be a challenge and the thing that i say with both dogs and other animals is you, you need to find what motivates them so with dogs the advice i give is well first of all um what breed is your dog because as you would know you know your french bulldog is very different to train than mile hello, hello. than my <laughs> a chihuahua is very different to train than my my german shepherd labrador mm. mix you know, French bulldogs were bred for very different reasons than Labradors. So first of all, what is your breed? What was it designed to do? I always am baffled by people who live in the inner city and have Kelpies or Border Collies mm. or Huskies. And then I get the call of, well, I, my collie keeps chasing cars when we're trying to walk down the street. And it's like, well, that's, mm. that's what your dog was bred to do. So what what is its um, breed? What's its, what's its purpose? What was it bred for? And then I look at it as an individual so I'm like, well, who is, for example, Gecko? You know, who is this dog? What motivates him? So the key with training any animal is to, to find out their natural history or their breed background and what motivates them. Because just because a Border Collie, one Border Collie loves to chase a bull doesn't mean that all of them will love to chase bulls. And you've just got to find out what, what gets them ticking. Um, and once you've found what motivates them, then training is very easy, providing you have an owner who is willing to put in the time and appreciate that it will take time and there's no quick fixes. Mm. So I guess the, the first part of that is really just understanding what their instincts are, their, mm, their really yeah. core instincts. Um, yeah, we, we've been breeding these dogs for hundreds of years and they've all pretty much served a purpose. Your French bulldog was bred to be a companion dog and, you know, as that can be a little bit stubborn at times, I'm sure, um, where my, you know, well, 
when he's a half breed like Doug Dig, a mix of Labrador and German Shepherd, you know, he's got a great guarding instinct, but also a, a wonderful retrieving instinct as well. Mm. So it's it's finding out what the purpose of that dog was. And I always tell people, think before you go and get a dog as well. Mm. Uh, even the even the cross breeds who are amazing, like I'm always promoting rescuing mixed breeds because they're just generally the healthier types of dogs. Mm. But you know, if you've got, for example, a, a husky crossed with a uh, what are some weird ones i've seen like beagles or something like that you know you've got two very conflicting yeah. <laughs> breeds and, yeah. and you and you don't know what you're going to get what side um mm. so a lot of dogs are frustrated when they're not able to to uh do the, the job that they were bred to do or at least some form of that so when you talk about the motivations, I mean, most people would assume that food is the motivator for mm. mo- most dogs, but you're talking about, you know, thinking beyond that as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Think beyond food. So I always, um, regardless if it's a dog or, or a shark or a koala, <laughs> I always offer them um, a choice of rewards to begin with, to find out what motivates them. Mm. Um, a story I just tell, I'm telling today, so I was doing a workshop today, is about a huge saltwater crocodile that I was training. And we used food as the reward. But actually what became the motivator was the training was tapping into his natural instinct, which was being an ambush predator. So I started off with a piece of food on a rope and was kind of playing a game, getting him to follow it. And then um, he had to kind of chase after it. And that kind of became the reward, the chase, not the actual food, because crocodiles can go for up to a year without food. Um, And then what became even more of a motivator for him was crocodiles are very clued on to to times and they pick up routines quickly in the wild and we did this training session at the same time every day so he would he would race out the water and wait for me to be there not in like oh emma you're here but oh one day i might get to kill her this could be the time because i know (laughs) she's here every day um so it, it was that was the reward that kind of mental stimulation him getting to use his natural instincts rather than just feeding him bits of um meat Mm. that 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 was just like nothing to him so yeah with with dogs yes treats might be the reward but you do need to think beyond that what does my dog need as a as a breed what Mm. what does it need so um you know you can use toys you can use praise food is the most common one um but as you, I suppose, get to know your dog more, you might find that actually it gets really excited when I let it go and chase a sprinkler just after a training session. You know, that could be its reward. Or it gets excited when I, I let it, I don't know, have a lure and I get it to, you know, chase that if it's like a greyhound or something. So it's, yeah, treats are great, but um, they're definitely not always the the ultimate reward for your dog and don't forget you know especially now we're at home more because of covid but when we all go back to work our dogs are often left on their own so Mm. training them just that being with you is such a big reward and that mental stimulation as well Mm, that's interesting i didn't want to cut you off because you were just like on on fire and just saying all these great things but did you (laughs) no cut me off go for it (laughs) did you say crocodiles can go for a year without eating Yes, yes, they That's can go. Crazy. So they're, they're, I know. So a lot of reptiles do because they get their energy from the um, from the sun uh, and right. from the heat, not from food. So yes, they can go for up to a year. So for example, my bearded dragon, she's got, just gone into Burmation, which is like a semi hibernation state, mm. and um, she won't eat now until September. Wow. I know the willpower, right? <laughs> Fairly intermittent fast. <laughs> yeah, 15 minutes go by and I'm like, oh, what can I go for next? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, they're, they're fantastic. Reptiles are great. Yeah. Um, you seem to have had a lot of experience, obviously, with you know exotic animals or what most people consider exotic animals. How is it, how, what are the similarities or differences between training dogs compared to you know a crocodile or something? Um. I mean, obviously, there's, there's differences in the sense that danger levels in that particular example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's not really a difference. I mean, I think the thing with dogs, because they've been domesticated for so long, they're more in tune to picking up on your cues that you might not even realize. Mm. Um, dogs are, are fantastic and they'll they'll pick up on things that we don't even realize we're doing. Uh, with training wild animals, it's all about finding that common language, that, that training language and, and having a mutual understanding where dogs can kind of pick up on things a little bit more because they're, they're domesticated, which is, doesn't, doesn't always work in your favor. 
Yeah. <laughs> so with you know, it can be a little bit more black and white with wild animals, where with dogs there's a lot more grey because they're they're smart, they pick up on things. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't know where to start. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm a great dog trainer any, anyway, but <laughs> um, you've got to have so much discipline, don't you? I think that was something else you hinted on when you were talking about the process you use to train the untrainable dog is most of the time, if it's not working, it's probably because there isn't enough discipline from the owner to apply what they need to apply, right? Yeah, and I mean, I get it as well. We're all busy. We all have different things going on and it just... I, I hardly do much training with my dogs. <laughs> my yeah, excuse yeah. Is, is because I, I spend so much time training other people's animals. Don't get me wrong. My dogs are what, how I want them. All I wanted were dogs that I could take anywhere mm. in any situation uh, with any types of person or animals and know that they'll be okay. And they are, but they're not, they don't do loads of tricks or, or yeah. crazy obedient <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but I think people don't always appreciate how much time it takes Mm. and that it's repetition and it's every day and you've got to commit and the big word that I say to uh, be a dog owner or a zookeeper that I'm teaching how to train it's all about consistency Mm. Um, that's the that's the most important word consistency yeah well I guess as you said everyone's got a you know a different happy place when they have a dog or any animal for that fact Um, you know what what life do you want to live with them? I mean, if you want to have mm. this like show dog that's really well trained and does all these tricks and all this kind of stuff, then it's totally different outcome to, you know, just wanting a dog, as you said, that is, can go places. So <laughs> Yeah, and then think about the breeds as well. Like if, if mm. you get, I don't know, say a, a Blue Heeler or a Border Collie and you just want a dog that's going to hang out with you in your house while you're, you know, doing working from home and then walk into the cafe with you, well, that is not the breed for you, that that dog wasn't designed to do that but Mm. maybe a french bulldog is more that type of dog for you so i think if you go ahead and get a breed and suddenly realize well something's not working well you need to then adapt your your style so for example if you were to adopt a a kelpie and you happen to live in the inner city and just thought you'd have a nice dog to you know go for a little stroll around the park with well you're going to have to do some stuff now to challenge that dog you're going to have to do trick training to mentally stimulate it so Mm. um You've got to think about that as well when you choose a breed of dog. How much time do you have to invest in training? I mean, chihuahuas were just bred to be companion dogs. So I can literally just, here he is, <laughs> take, him, take him everywhere. Um, and all he wants to do is just hang out with me because mm. that, that's the, sorry, Gecko, but you said no other purpose. I apologize <laughs> for telling you that. Um, so, but it, I would never go and adopt a husky. God, I have no, I have no desire to have to run a dog, you know, for hours every day, let alone the grooming on top of that. So definitely depending on the breed also depends what type of training you do with it. Yeah. And I think you've, you've hinted towards it a few times. If you've got a dog that requires like those working dogs, the, I mean, that requires so much exercise and, and need a lot of stimulation, it's, it's, most of the time, I won't judge everyone for doing it, but it's it's probably not nice to be having them in a you know an apartment living style or an inner city lifestyle, um, if if you can. <laughs> I mean, and sometimes it works. Some people some people do it and it works. It's fine, but I think it's a real um, luck of the draw on mm. you know what you end up with. Um, I just know, yeah, as much as I, I love border collies and the idea of having a dog that's so smart, I could train it to do so many things is incredible. But I know I don't have the time, even as a professional animal trainer, to give that dog what it would need. I mean, they're beautiful dogs and they, yeah, I mean, they're lovely looking dogs, but also, like oh. you said, they're so trainable and like so intelligent. Um, you just got to have the right lifestyle for the to have that kind of dog, I guess, as you mentioned. With any dog, yeah. you've got to have the right lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I am. Look, I, I, I know, I know my weaknesses, and exercise is one of them. <laughs> and if it's pouring down with rain, I don't particularly want to go out of the house. And thank goodness I have two dogs, which are fine with that, and we can just play some games. But also, they'll just be really happy cuddling with me um, while we're watching a movie as well. And I know that there's definitely some. Uh, dogs which would not be satisfied with that well on the flip side as well like if if you if you are a super active person you want to mm. go running with your dog or something like that i mean you, you shouldn't be getting like dachshunds and french bulldogs and these dogs oh, that, that shouldn't be doing so much exercise you know what i mean like yeah yeah absolutely or you know like masters and things which can have heart issues or mm. anything like that gosh yeah. no 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 it's yeah. absolutely you're 100 right will there's a there's a flip side to it as well um 
And I'm always big for going to the rescue shelters and organizations to see what they have. Um, the rescue group I got Gecko from, they actually don't have any of their dogs in kennels. They're all in foster homes, which was amazing. I mean, when I got Gecko, I had so much information on him because he had lived in a home environment. So they could tell me so much. It wasn't as much as a mystery as it would be going into a rescue kennel environment. Mm. Um, so I'm always saying to people, well, look, if you're not, if you just want a pet and a companion and not a dog which has, you want a breed specific trait, then just go and have a look at rescues as well. Mm. Um, because especially in the foster home variety, you often be able to tell if it's going to suit your lifestyle or not. Yeah, I think the the better rescue organizations have as much information as possible whether they've been with foster foster parents or you call them parents i don't know foster owners um, but <laughs> i feel in this day and age it's parents it's fur babies yeah, yeah, yeah. and parents and adoptive mums i don't know but if you are going to rescue for the first time um and maybe you're not used to having a dog you need as much information about the dog as, as you can get i think yeah, but also puppies are really hard work. Hmm. So that's that's the other thing that people, the thing that I hear is, well, rescue dogs are tainted. I'm just going to get a puppy. And it's like, dude, puppies are hard work. And these rescue dogs ended up, they were first of all puppies yeah. that someone got <laughs> and then stuffed it up. So it's, um, yeah, puppies aren't always the answer either. They're a lot of work. <laughs> I've, I've never had a puppy. They are just way too much work for me. I've never spoken to anyone that's had a puppy that hasn't been surprised by how much work it was it's yeah, so much thank god is. they grow up quick yeah um okay so if you had to give one final bit of advice to people that were looking to train the untrainable dog what would that be is it about consistency or uh if you have an untrainable dog the one piece of advice i'd say is hire a dog trainer don't put the stress on trying to do it yourself mm. um find a dog trainer who fits your way of thinking and learning because there's dog trainers are, are very different mm. um, and get some guidance. And I think support would be the main word because as an owner, if you know, you're not expected to know how to do everything with your dog. And especially if your dog has some underlying behavioral issues, which could be down to bad breeding or just a, an unfortunate past, then you're going to, you know, probably need some professional help, just someone who can guide you on the way. So mm. don't try to do it on your own. Um, don't give up and just, uh, yeah, it, it, I've never met a dog that's not trainable. Hmm. Well, that's good. I guess that's uh, good to know for people out there that might think they're, they're you know, they've gone too far. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, look, it's di different circumstances. If it was a, a very dangerous dog, then it's something, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not going to just say, just get a dog trainer. It will be fine. You, know, you might, might need a little bit more than that. Hmm. But I would definitely seek professional help. So how would you summarize, I mean, you mentioned that every dog trainer has a different approach to training. How would you summarize mm. your, your methodology, your way of thinking? Uh, so I suppose the comedian in me, um, I, when I approach clients, I bring, I suppose, a sense of humor mm. because often they're stressed and the comedian in me just wants to, to break that stress and that tension. Um, I think... I approach it as very reassuring and try to be relatable and try to to work on a way of training that dog that will suit that person and their lifestyle. Um, and then just catching up with people regularly mm. as well, not leaving them on their own for, for weeks or months, but doing regular catch-ups. And just every, every way I train animals about giving the animal choice as well. Um, I find when you use um, that type of method methodology, um, like positive reinforcement, you're going to get long-term better results. Mm. Um, and I feel also my training methods, I, you have to make sure you're very clear to the animal, be it a dog or a crocodile, what you want. Uh, and with that, it's making sure owners stick to that clear message and don't deviate. Very good, very good. Well, Emma, I've had an absolute ball having a chat to you today. Um, we've learned a lot about your background. We've learned about some exotic animals. We've learned about training the untrainable dog. Um, where should people go to find out more about you? I'm sure there's people, some people might want to find 
your next comedy show and other people might want to hire you as a dog trainer. So <laughs> To be fair, they're all the same. Um, <laughs> you'll get a show if you hire me as a dog trainer. You'll learn some training tips if you come to my comedy show. They're just very slowly just kind of all uh, meshing into one net. So um, while I'm on social media, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, um, and I also have a website as well, which will be updated soon because I need to get onto that. Um, but yeah, you can just find me on social media, reach out. So it's Emma Malik. Um, oh no, Emma Malik comedian. There we go. That's what okay. it is. I had to think about that. What am I? Um, <laughs> but yeah, you, you can reach out and, um, I have a web series on YouTube called celebrities patting animals where I interview celebrities whilst they're patting animals. It's in the <laughs> title of the show, but you can learn a little about people and animals as well in that one. So just, yeah, just, just Google Emma Malik stuff will come up yeah. and reach out if you have any questions. Perfect. So Emma Malik.com is the website, but I'll also share, um, you know, all your social handles and the YouTube channel because it, it sounds like I need to watch that. It sounds like an awesome channel. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks again, Emma, for coming on The Dog Show. I've had a, had a fun time and uh, I hope you have a good one. Thank you so much, Will.